Um, welcome to the SOA's webcast, Ask the Expert. We're very glad you've been able to join us and join the conversation today to find out some answers to the common questions we get from our employer community. We will discuss the free affiliate membership programs available, also talk about the micro-credentials that can be earned on the pathway to ASA, and talk also about the University Earned Credit Program. My name is Amy Schutzenofer, and I lead the SOA's efforts in reaching and engaging our employer community. Feel free to reach out to me via email and connect with me on LinkedIn. Last year, we launched a new webpage designed to help you locate resources and stay engaged as you support your staff. Please bookmark this so you can check back often and stay up to date on the latest employer news. As you see, this webcast is being recorded and will be posted to this page in early March. It can be found on our website uh, via the Professional Development tab, Employer Products, or you can find it simply by typing in SOA and Employer on your search bar at the top, and then this page should come up. Uh, we are going to uh, explain that we've got some presenters today. We've got Stuart Klugman, SOA Senior Staff Fellow in Education. We've got Gina Long, Director of Professionalism and University Relations, and Marta jimenez Lauder, Manager of Candidate Engagement. So what we'll do is our presenters will give a brief review of the various programs that we have in place to support you and your candidates. So please enter any questions you might have into the chat window, and we will address those at the end of the presentations. Great, thanks for advancing the slides. So first, I wanna give you just a quick overview of our latest strategic plan as it relates to our topics today. Our strategy has a lot of components. The strategic themes are where you will see the different ways in which we're working to fulfill our purpose statement, which is, the SOA empowers members to drive solutions to life's financial risks. We're doing this in four ways. First, we're emphasizing education on skills. Second, by accelerating international growth. Third, by cultivating community experience. And fourth, by spotlighting societal purpose. These themes don't stand alone. Each theme supports the other. Um, if we can move to slide five, please. Thanks. Uh, this represents our future state. Well, we really want our candidates, members, and employers to say about the SOA, uh, SOA education when they're done. For candidates, we want them to be well-informed about the career from the beginning and engaged with the SOA and the profession. We want them to see us as on their side. Uh, again, the tests aren't going to get any easier, but we want them to feel supported as they go through the process. Candidates will gain critical skills, in actuarial science, data science, and predictive analytics combined with creativity, leadership, and judgment. As candidates become members, they will continue to see the SOA as a lifelong learning partner. Finally, we hope you as employers will see SOA's professional development programs as essential in your efforts to de develop support and actually retain your staff. We want you to turn to the SOA first for your staff's development needs. Uh, if we can move on to slide six, there are a lot of changes going on in education. We definitely want to stop here and pause and look at a few of the things that we're doing for members to achieve this, since we're obviously going to be talking about the candidate vertical in detail today. In addition to our certificate programs, in 2022, we've returned to offering in-person meetings. This year, we're going to have both in-person and improved virtual options for our major meetings in 2023. In case you're unaware of the products that we have designed specifically for our employers, I'd like to let you know that we're offering two corporate subscription products. Our corporate webcast subscription offers seven 14 and 21 pack webcasts bundled to save your budget dollars and in essence offering the same quality webcasts at a reduced price. Additionally, we're looking to expand our current corporate recording library subscription to include non-SOA content, filling out the PD opportunities for your staff. Please contact me with questions about either one. So let's get started today uh, by asking Marta uh, Jimenez-Lutter to share some of the exciting programs and support 
that we are offering to our candidates. Hello, thank you, Amy. So good morning. My name is Marta Jimenez Lauder, and I am the manager of candidate engagement for the Society of Actuaries. So what does it mean, candidate engagement? Candidate engagement for us is a way to reach um, students, career changers, anybody that might be interested in the um, actuarial profession early on, create um, excitement about it, and then support them on their actuarial journey. So what we want to do is create a relationship with our candidates where they see themselves as part of the site of actuaries early on and not as a transactional relationship. And how do you do, how do we do that? So we work by in a lot of different ways. And one of those ways is um, our affiliate membership. We launched this in 2021 in October, and it was designed to provide information, tools, support to students, high school um, students, high school students, uh, elementary students, college students, uh, their parents, if they have questions, the counselors, uh, uh, maybe high school math students, and also to counselors or anybody that can influence or have any any sort of advice to give to uh, those students. So that was launched, in, as I said, in 2021. And today we have 6,052 affiliate members around the world. While our um, highest membership uh, countries are the United States, Canada, and um, China, we have um, some very large emerging markets and growing in Malaysia and in India. So we are definitely reaching across the globe. The content of the affiliate membership was created, was developed to address some pain points that our candidates uh, brought up. So some of the, um, um, when we talked to our candidates, they said they wanted to develop soft skills they learn about different facets of the profession and receive more information about the SAM process. So we host Lunch and Learns once a month on a Friday, it's just a half an hour, and we talk to a um, expert in the, <laughs> in the subject. We have done uh, some in programming languages, we have done some with exam graders, explaining what it is like to take an exam, and then what it's like to create an exam and then grade it. That was very popular and our candidates had a lot of questions about the process. But we touch on a lot of different things because actuaries are so varied. So for example, we have one in March with um, an actuary in Canada who is also a painter, an artist. His art is fabulous. And he talks to he will talk to us about how he combines his passion for math and actuarial science and his passion for painting. Um, his name is Harris Sardar and he is an FSA FCIA. Then on March 3rd, we are gonna have the chance to talk to our past SOA president, Jennifer Gillespie. And she's gonna talk about leadership and again, a little bit about what it is like to be a candidate versus um, an exam grader because she has been both and also um, her journey as a as a president of the Society of Actuaries. Um, we have e-learning tools for um, our affiliates, and we designed this as um, as we hear more about what they want and what they need. For example, I'm going to share. Hold on, I'm going to share my screen so you can see. Okay. Hold on. Okay, here we are. So when you go to the affiliate membership page, you will see all of these wonderful benefits. So you have a video library, the events and networking was what I was talking about the Lunch and Learns. These are on-demand courses. So the on-demand courses, when you go to the page, as you can see, they are anything from interviews to presentation skills, um, Excel basics, Excel advanced. And also we recently introduced Python because we heard that that is a very good um, base language, programming language to learn and build from that. Um, 
what you can see, these are all videos talking to any about anything from what is the actuarial profession, how much do actuarials make, and so on and so forth. The this is the peer and peer networking. So as you can see, you um no, hold on. So I that that I just wanted to show you that so you can see what your affiliates, the affiliate members see when they go on, on our website and all the resources that they have available for them. Um we also heard from them that they wanted to network, network with other candidates and network with employers and, and members. So we organize Canada Connect events around the United States and Canada. We have um, a Canada Connect align with each one of the of the uh, major SOA meetings. So Life, Health and Impact, which is the annual meeting. And their candidates get to attend the sessions with the can with the actuaries and see what a real session for actuaries is, what a professional development is. They also get to talk to uh, the members that are there, um, the SOA staff, and sometimes employers that might be there. And then we have two standalones. This year we have one in the spring in Chicago and then one in the fall in Ottawa. Those are half days and they're just for candidates and they're very targeted to developing the skills that they want from um, creating a resume to interview skills, interpersonal skills. And usually we include a panel of actuaries from the area that um, talk about their experience in the particular field. Those are very popular. And uh, as I said, um, we, we try to change the location, but one in the United States and one in Canada usually. We also heard from the candidates that they wanted mentoring. So we created the MentorLink program. The MentorLink program is run by volunteers. So all of our mentors are volunteers and you can choose to do a short term, which means a candidate will just reach out to you and say, hey, I have a question about X, Y, or Z. And then you have a conversation. You also can, um, re can do a long term, which is three months. Three months is where you get a, in a relationship with a, a mentor, with a mentor, um, a, the mentor and the mentee get into a relationship. The mentee gets to choose what they want. Um, and that relationship could be via Zoom, via um, on over the telephone, or if you guys live in the same area, you can just get together and do meetings in person. It is totally up to the mentor and the mentee. And I want to talk about another tool that we have at the Society of Actuaries. It's called the SOA Explorer. It's a free tool, and this is available for anybody that is um, a member or an affiliate or a candidate. All you have to do is have an SOA.org account. And it tells you, it's an interactive map that tells you where the employers are, where the actual clubs are. Are there internships or jobs available in your area? It is incredibly helpful and you can reach out to, the our candidates can reach out to, let's say they want to work for, I don't know, all state. Um, they can just see what actuaries are at all state in their, in their community or in their area and reach out to them and say, hey, I'm very interested in working in your field. Um, can you just talk to me a little bit about what it is like to be part of Allstate? So we have had actuaries that have, that were, for example, in one area in, let's say, Chicago, and they wanted to work in the East Coast. So they reached out to actuaries in Philadelphia or New York or Boston, and were able to get a job there. So it is definitely a very useful tool. And also just to get into actuarial clubs in your area or just figure out where actuaries are in the world. Um, so that is the affiliate membership, but we also have the professional affiliate membership. The professional affiliate membership is a little different. Uh, this is not free and it's only available to those who have, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> to those who have completed completed two micro credentials. So I think um, Stuart or um, Gina might talk about the micro credentials later. So there are three micro credentials 
three actuarial foundations, actuarial science foundations, and data science for actuaries. So once the candidate completes two of these, they can apply to be professional members. This is kind of like the Hulu Plus or your premium uh, subscription. You get all the all the the same benefits as the affiliate members, plus um, access to leadership training, networking opportunities, technical podcasts, and um, as I said, this is $99 and you have to have the second micro credential to be able to apply. Um, the DEI, the, our, our efforts to reach out um, is, are very tied to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we focus on an underrepresented student. So through these efforts, we intend to increase the pipeline of candidates coming into the profession and create a more diverse and inclusive profession. We have a variety, a variety of efforts that include increasing awareness and providing support early on and throughout their actuarial journey. We have different programs, um, including uh, a partnership that we have with CAS, um, with it is be an actuary. Uh, where we host events for high school students around the United States. In February of 2022, we had a virtual event that had more than 200 volunteer signups and more than 225 teachers and students in attendance. In November of 2022, we had another event at the Paul with more than 150 students from five local Chicago schools and 25 local volunteers. Our next event for Be an Actuary will take place in Temple University in March. And we also partner with affinity groups sponsoring virtual events, providing space at our meetings, inviting them to be part of our DEI receptions in all the major meetings, and also encouraging them to submit session proposals for our major meetings. Some of the organizations that we partner with are the International Association of Black Actuaries, IABA, the Organization of Latino Actuaries, OLA, the Sexuality and Gender Alliance of Actuaries, SAGA, and the Network of Actuarial Women and Allies, NAWA. DEI needs-based reimbursement programs are developed um, for those who there we pay. Um, this is also a partnership with the CAS, and we provide exam reimbursement and um, stipends for students um, that are from underrepresented communities. So there are some exams that they're eligible for and they also get some reimbursement for their study materials. We also have another program that is the needs-based exam reimbursement program. And this is for um, kids or people who need um, some financial assistance. So there are some requirements obviously that people have to meet, but that's what that was intended for. And this program, as I said, the program reimbursement and also um, a stipend for study material. In 2022, there were 20, 225 diversity and needs-based reimbursements awarded and more than 100 material stipends in the same period. If you would like, if you have any um, candidates or anybody who works in the organizations and you want them to see if they qualify for this, they can go to beanactuary.org and they will, there's more information about that. Our outreach efforts also extend to partnerships with STEM focused organizations, such as the National Consortium and Secondary STEM Schools. And also we attend regional conferences um, in the United States and Canada. In uh, January, we were in ASNA, the, which is the Actuarial Students National Association that took place in Toronto. And we have also attended the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. We are also connecting with community colleges in Los Angeles and in Michigan. Our focus are community colleges with curriculums that align closely with what we require from our UCAP schools. We look for colleges with a diverse population and um, not racial diversity, but also socioeconomic uh, diversity, age diversity, career background diversity, and colleges that have a such way into, a, into four actu four year actuarial programs. Um, as I said, this all this information is available at SOA.org and you we are I am well, I am 
happy to answer any questions you might have and send you in the right direction. So that's all I have today. And thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Marta. Uh, Stuart, I think we're going to turn things over to you now. And I just sent a note out in the uh, in the uh, chat. If everybody can just enter questions as you have them, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much. <clears throat> all right, thank you, Marta, and uh, glad to be here with all of you. Um, I've got a, a fairly brief presentation, uh, which will allow us a uh, lots of question time when we're all finished. Um, a while back, uh, as Marta mentioned, we introduced micro credentials. Um, and if we can go to the uh, next uh, slide, uh, we not only have micro credentials, uh, those who earn micro credentials have the opportunity to claim a digital badge, uh, something which I'm told people much younger than I am appreciate getting and find ways to use them on their LinkedIn pages and um, other uh, email signatures and, and other places where they can let it be known that they've uh, uh, made a uh, good milestone accomplishment uh, from the SOA. So that's the artwork, the three digital badges and the three names. If we'll go to the next slide, um, we can see how we uh, formulated those uh, micro-credentials. The first one's called pre-actuarial foundations. Um, it's the first column on our diagram of the pathway to ASA. All three of our micro-credentials are subsets of the ASA pathway. So candidates don't have to go off the path to earn a micro-credential. Everything they do will contribute towards uh, the earning their ASA if that's their ultimate goal. Uh, so the five components of the uh, micro-credential are ones that can be taken more or less in any order uh, at any time. Um, we have two exams, financial mathematics and probability two of the three VEEs to get at university in, in economics and accounting and finance. So you might look at all four of those as sort of the, the non-actuarial toolkit that a person would need to acquire so that they have the ability to learn how to do actuarial calculations. Uh, but there's no actuarial content uh, in those four uh, items. Uh, the part that to me is the most exciting is the addition of the pre-actuarial foundations uh, e-learning module. Um, unlike the FAP modules, which had previously been the first place at which a candidate would encounter our e-learning system, we really want our candidates to, to dive into it at this stage. They do have to complete the two exams before they can register for the module, but we really want people to sign up at this uh, point. In that module, we'll accomplish two things with them that I think are really important early in their uh, development as potential actuaries. One of them is an introduction to the actuarial profession. So in particular, if they've not yet had an internship or much exposure to what being an actuary is all about uh, in their school programs, uh, the module goes into some detail about what it is actuaries do, what it means to be a professional, and uh, what they're getting into as they embark on this career. The other thing we've incorporated into this module that takes up the bulk of it is our emphasis on um, two skills that we think are very important for actuaries but aren't technical, and that is uh, emotional quotient and adaptability quotient uh, skills. And we've got a lot of training in this uh, module to help our candidates uh, develop those skills, but perhaps even more important to send a strong signal uh, to our future actuaries that these are just as important as being able to do the math. Once they have this, they can go on to the next micro-credential. So next slide, please. So actuarial science foundations gives our candidates at this point the ability to do basic calculations. Someone who has this knowledge could work as an actuarial technician, could build spreadsheets, do some calculations. They have those basics of what actuaries do um, and the uh, elements of pricing, reserving of uh, variance insurance products, understanding some statistical concepts, and then doing a second e-learning module, which again now requires uh, two more exams, the FAM and SRM be completed uh, before they can uh, register for that second module. And uh, when they've completed that, um, uh, that'll have uh, furthered their enhancement of these uh, soft skills I talked about earlier, and also give them uh, further appreciation for what actuarial problems look like and the kind of work they'll be doing uh, when they get into their career. 
So we're marking uh, two milestones along the pathway with these uh, two micro credentials. I'm told as of about a month ago, we've had uh, 247 with the pre actuarial foundations. A micro credential 85 with actual science foundations and and some of this is because um, of those new modules um, they only came on recently uh, are not a requirement for asa uh, for the moment uh, candidates can still use the previous fap modules to get their asa uh, so uh, unless a candidate has chosen to go back and get those modules uh, what we're really appealing to at the moment are those candidates who are new to the pathway uh, for whom uh, those modules are now a requirement on their way to ASA. Our third micro credential is a little bit different. And so if we can go to the next slide, we've carved out the uh, components of the pathway that directly relate to predictive analytics or data science or statistics or whatever you like to call it. But the uh, two exams in the assessment, uh, statistics for risk modeling, uh, predictive analytics, they were both introduced in 2018. And then the newer advanced topics in predictive analytics, which was added to the pathway in 2022. So again, uh, we've only had a, a handful of uh, candidates earn this micro-credential uh, because the uh, ATPA exam is brand new. And a lot of candidates are not being required at the moment to take that um, uh, course to get their ASA as in the transition, they could use the IFM uh, exam instead. Uh, but the IFM exam is no longer available to candidates. So anyone coming along at this point uh, would only be using the ATPA exam, <clears throat> excuse me, to get their ASA. And so they, will be a lot earning uh, this micro-credential uh, in the future as these three become required for everybody. I have one more slide just as a summary to, uh, of where, where we are with the ASA pathway. This is uh, after the changes that were adopted by the board in 2021. Uh, almost all of them have been uh, put into place. The last remaining components are those advanced long-term and short-term actuarial mathematics exams. Uh, they're being given for the first time spring of 2023. Uh, everything else has been given uh, at least once by now, some of them more times, um, but that'll be the completion of our new pathway and new set of requirements to get the ASA. Um, and Amy, I noticed um, we, we said we would take uh, questions at the end, but I think I saw an easy one pop up in the chat. You're welcome to take that so if you'd why like. Don't I, why don't I take that one now um, uh, while I've got the microphone? It says, do candidates need to apply separately or is it automatically attained? Um, no, it's my understanding, and, and I'll, I'll take some help if I've got this one wrong. Um, I believe you get the micro-credential as a transcript thing, but if you want the digital badge, you do have to make an application for that. Uh, that does not become available automatically. I believe there's no charge for it, uh, but just the technical process uh, underlying uh, how you get the digital badge attached to you uh, requires a formal application uh, once you've completed the requirements. Uh, but if someone else um, has a better answer than I, uh, please chime in. Okay, well, I'll take more questions about the pathway or any other changes uh, that we've been making or aspects of uh, ASA or FSA education uh, after you hear from Gina, who I believe is up next. Great, thanks, Stuart. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about our new uh, university earned credit program, um, but it, as kind of a lead into that, I just wanted to share a little bit about how we engage with universities. And one of the key ways that we do that is through what we call our UCAP list. Um, you may or may, may not be familiar with it, but that UCAP stands for Universities and Colleges with Actuarial Programs. And within this UCAP list, um, there are three tiers of recognitions for universities. Um, the first being introductory curriculum level, 
Um, and this typically is when a university has coverage in their curriculum for at least two of the SOA exams. So in many cases, it's P and FM, or perhaps one other exam. Uh, at the advanced curriculum level, the next tier, uh, university would have um, at least four exams covered in their curriculum. Um, but for those first two tiers, those are pretty much the, the main requirements. They need to have some VEE, uh, but they need to have at least two exams for the introductory level and four exams for the advanced level. Um, and then the highest tier is the Center of Actuarial Excellence tier, uh, where where um, universities need to have full coverage for our exams. I believe we require five exams now. Um, and many other uh, aspects as well need to be covered. We have eight uh, fairly rigorous criteria that are required for CAE. And, um, and those universities have, that have met all of those requirements and continue to meet those through annual uh, check-ins. Um, just to give you an idea on this UCAP list, there are over 300 universities, uh, about 185 at the intro level. I think we're at 96 in the advanced curriculum level, and there are 38 CAE schools currently. And next slide, please. So university earned credit, uh, UBC allows university students to become eligible for SOA exam credit by attaining a designated UEC mark on an approved university course at SEAE University. So I, I read that pretty much word for word because I didn't wanna miss any part of that because it's all important. Um, the, uh, the CAE University has to be separately approved to offer UEC. Uh, they don't get that just by virtue of being a CAE University. Uh, they apply separately for that and um, a much more rigorous process around their curriculum the actual course syllabi, the exams that they offer students, and especially the final exam that they offer students all have to meet uh, our, our standards for this program. But what are why did we put this in place? Um, um, many may ask, and when the board approved this, um, it was for a few reasons. Some of them are listed here, um, and, and I think the top one is probably the key reason that this was approved. Uh, and it's because this program is intended to help those strong candidates who are in actuarial programs who might be kind of drawn to other areas such as data science. Uh, we've seen students being drawn away from the actuarial profession into data science. And one of the reasons given is typically, you know, they, there's no series of exams separate from their university coursework that's required there. So, so this UEC program for students at CAE universities is a, is a way of allowing them to make more efficient progress so that they, if they're, they're typically students um, who would have probably passed the exam on the first try anyway. Um, so it aids that progress. Second, competitive internationally. So the, the Society of Actuaries is actually a little late to the game on this and the rest of the world has been running university or credit type programs for, for decades. Uh, in the UK, in Australia, in Canada now for quite a while. Uh, so we're a little late to the game, um, but feel that this will help us a little bit uh, with our, our competition with other actuarial organizations for those bright candidates, um, in particular in Asia. Uh, the ability to add more EQAQ, students who go through the CAE University programs um, are vetted on the uh, the additional skills and benefits that are provided in a, in a, in a broad actuarial program that, that the CAE schools provide contact with employers, um, the student clubs, speakers on campus, um, a lot of additional supports rather than just uh, teaching to the exams. Uh, and I think we're ready going to the next slide, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about um, some might be concerned that this is an easier route or think that this is somehow an easier route. Um, so we just wanted to talk a little bit about some of these high standards that I alluded to earlier. Um, there is a very thorough review of the syllabus coverage and it does need to meet uh, that syllabus of, our, of the related SOA exam. 
80% of the grading points must come from in-person proctored exams in these courses. So it can't be, you know, a whole bunch of group work where we're not sure if that student actually contributed that's at the same level. No, 80% of the grading points come from in-person proctored exams. Um, the midterms and finals are approved by our external examiners. The external examiners are actuaries who we have recruited and trained for these roles. Um, and they work directly with the university faculty on these courses to ensure that the syllabi are at the proper level and that the exams are of the right depth and cover uh, the, the needed um, content of those exams. Um, on that final exam, it does have to be cumulated for the entire course and worth at least 50% of the grading points, so quite a heavy level on the final. Uh, additionally, the grading results are also reviewed by the external examiner to make sure that nothing looks out of, uh, out of whack there. Um, and then, um, and really maybe most importantly to note, is it's not just passing these courses that would give a student a UEC, UEC credit. Um, they have to establish a high score in the course. So it's more like a, like a B plus. Um, we have specific percentages that we give the universities, but it, it is a higher score than just passing the course. And um, just to kind of, uh, you can leave that slide up, but just to kind of finish that off, just to let you know where we're at and rolling out this program. So we are just now getting to the end of the first cycle of UEC applications. So in this first year out of the 38 CAE schools, 13 of those applied in the first round to be uh, to offer UEC, and we have a few more applications in the hopper now. Um, those 13 were approved to offer UEC, and many of them started their first UEC courses in the fall of 2022. So we've been through the whole process with the external examiners, um, checking in on the, the syllabi and exams through the fall of last year and, and um, confirming the grading results at the end of the semester and in this January. Um, um, they, the schools reported to us the students who made those grades, made the appropriate grade in order to be eligible. And now we have started reaching out to those candidates and they are actually um, able to make the application, <clears throat> pardon me, um, able to make application now for their UEC credit. Um, so we're almost through the, the entire first cycle. Uh, let's go ahead and see. So diversity extension. So I um, wanted to talk a little bit about this side of, of UEC. We also offer um, by invitation currently uh, the ability for a university that is serving um, a high number of diverse students, uh, such as a historically Black college or university or a Hispanic serving institution. Um, one of those universities can uh, set themselves up as a UEC diversity extension university. Um, and we just approved in January our first, um, first university to be part of that program. And that is um, uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore. So we're happy to have them as our, our, our first diversity extension school. And, and it, the program basically works the same way it does in the same rigorous standards we have for the normal UEC program with CAE schools. But this is available for exam FM only um, to kind of get these schools started uh, with a structure that you know, is set up to, to work um, with our UEC program criteria. Um, but we do provide additional uh, support from in the educational area and financial support. There's a stipend given to help those universities pay for perhaps they need to bring in um, an actuary to, to teach the course. Um, so we do provide financial support for that. Um, but they do need, again, as I said, to meet that same syllabus exam rigorous standards as they would for, uh, as any of the CAE schools would um, to meet this to make to be a part of the diversity extension program. Um, so I think with that I'm finished and um, again I'm happy to take questions at the appropriate time too. It looks like it may be there now.
Great, thank you. We'll have Stuart and Marta come back on screen and go ahead. Uh, we do have one question that I would like to start the panel off with, if possible. Uh, the question that came in beforehand is, does the panel have any advice for employers on how to adapt to the changes in curriculum in terms of the benefits they provide students? For example, is there any advice on how to adapt their student program for the FSA exam hours being reduced? Example, study time, et cetera. I guess that sounds like one for me, Amy. Um, so for the specific question, uh, this year in 2023, starting with the spring exams, um, for most tracks, we've reduced the required number of exam hours from 12 to 10. There are still three exams in each track, uh, but instead of a 5-5-2 pattern, um, there's a pattern that varies by track. Uh, one common pattern is a 4-3-3, for example. Um, and so, uh, the amount of material we're expecting candidates to learn uh, has also been reduced. So the curriculum committees were instructed and did uh, reduce the amount of material covered uh, in proportion to the uh, two hour reduction in time and also to make, uh, uh, as they've always done, try to make each exam uh, material proportional to the exam hours. So to some degree, the principle that I think many of you have already been using and have used for a long time is that uh, study time may relate to exam hours uh, would still hold. So the proportion of reading, the amount of material expected to be learned uh, does continue to be proportional to the hours on the exam. Um, so I think for fellowship exams, uh, other than the fact that the, the number of hours per exam has changed, the uh, policies you might choose to apply to your candidates as they study uh, should be uh, similar uh, as well. Um, for the ASA, it's a little bit different with some of the changes, and, uh, and I know many of you are still adapting to that, and, and it's not always as clear uh, how much time might be allocated for students. So, for example, the PA and ATPA exams both uh, have modules that uh, provide the instruction, so the way candidates study is different. And um, in particular, with the ATPA being a take-home exam, uh, there isn't a traditional number of exam hours that applies uh, to that exam. Um, you've also probably noted that the PA exam has shrunk from five and a quarter hours to three and a half hours. And again, we did trim the amount of module material proportionately uh, for candidate instruction uh, for that exam. Um, and so that uh, would be a good benchmark as well. Um, there's also a bit of uh, variation you might find early on as uh, candidates uh, adapt to some of the other changes. Uh, for example, um, it appears that uh, candidates are finding the new FAM exam a bit challenging in the fact that there is quite a bit of diverse material to learn. And so I think you might be experiencing or finding a need to give candidates a little more study time. Uh, for those who are studying for the full FAM exam during the transition period, um, maybe more than a uh, exam of that three and a half hour length would warrant just because of the, the diversity of material and, and the amount is, is a bit bigger than some exams those your candidates might have seen uh, earlier on uh, relative to exam length. So a few adjustments uh, in that regard. Okay, Stuart, we do have a couple more questions um, for you. Uh, one is, are there discounted rates for students taking exams? If so, where is the information located? Uh, well, the answer is definitely yes. Um, so we have a variety of discounts. I'm not familiar with, with all of them. Uh, one is, um, uh, there's a, uh, for many exams, there's a student discount. So if you're enrolled at university, as opposed to uh, being a full-time employee, um, there is a discounted price. Uh, there are a variety of, uh, of other discount programs. <clears throat> um, we, we have programs in place for, uh, for students in special uh, categories. I'm, I'm not sure where those are, Mar Marta may know. Um, there's also uh, from our general information page, I believe there's a, a link to uh, uh, discounts for international candidates, which uh, are also available and they do vary by exam. I think on the exam fee page, 
Uh, the only one that's directly indicated uh, on the list of exam fees is the student discount, uh, but elsewhere on the uh, examination general information page, I think you'll find links for the other discounts. Yes, okay. I will put in the chat the link for the diversity um, reimbursement and the needs space. So you anybody can can see them and access them. Uh, Stuart, I have another one for you. Thank you, Marta. Uh, do candidates need to apply for a micro credential separately or is it automatically attained when they complete the necessary requirements? OK, yeah, I think that's the one I covered right at the end of my, okay. my presentation. Okay. So I think we did that one. Thank you. Um, would the SOA consider making the courses available to ASAs as well? Our candidates would surely enjoy the items shown earlier in the presentation regarding public speaking, et cetera, since they're still developing. So I think I think what's being referred to are, are the two new um, uh, modules uh, that we introduced uh, at the early stage in the micro credentials. Um, they're actually always available. Uh, one of our policies is that even if you don't need to uh, uh, take an exam for your credential or if you're already credentialed, uh, you can always sign up for any of our exams or modules uh, that you wish. The only rule we have is you can't retake one you've passed. Uh, not sure anyone why anyone would want to retake an exam they've already passed, but we actually don't allow it. Uh, but we allow our associates fellows uh, to take uh, as they, if they see an exam that was not there when they were uh, studying and earning their credentials, you can, uh, you're free to sign up for them. Uh, that's, that's always been the policy. Um, and obviously you, you probably don't care at that point whether you pass it or not, if you just want the uh, learning experience. So yeah, those modules are always available. Um, one thing we, we might look into, and I don't know if we've done that or not, um, so that's a takeaway for us. Um, and so uh, Amy, help me remember this. Uh, typically when we've created modules uh, in particular, we've made them available for professional development uh, completely outside the uh, credentialing system. And the difference is the PD version would not have an assessment at the end. So you didn't have to decide whether you wanted to try and pass it or not. I do not know uh, offhand if we've made those two new modules available for, for PD as well. Okay, I will, I made a note of that. Okay, okay. Gina, uh, I'm sorry, were you finished, Stuart? Yep. Okay, great. Um, Gina, I have one for you. Uh, talking about the UEC uh, accomplish, um, how does the UEC accomplish driving people to the actuarial career path? Um, they wouldn't this put students who do not attend CAE schools as an at an advantage and discourage them from pursuing the career. For example, um, this uh, the person the question that asked the question didn't see any of the top U.S. universities, top 20 US, U.S. universities on the list of CAE schools. And should we be discouraging students from those institutions and from pursuing the profession? So I think it's really uh, revolving around the CAE schools and how does UEC accomplish driving people to the path pathway? Okay. Um, and maybe I misspoke. So I didn't intend to say that it drives students toward the path of being an actuary necessarily. It was meant to retain students who are already about 30% of just shy maybe of 30 or excuse me maybe over 30 almost a third of, of candidates already attend CAE universities um so it was meant to retain those students who you know might start actuarial and then be drawn into you know many universities create are creating and have already created in the last two to three years uh data science programs um so it was more to retain those students in that had already started down the path and you know it's a and if you're going to a CAE school to study actuarial science, as many do, it is a way to you know, help encourage you and make it more efficient for you. Um, you're right, it's not gonna make a difference for every student. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know, I can't comment on, you know, you said you don't see any of the top 20 universities in the US on that list. I don't know that most of our actuaries come from those universities anyway. Um, as I mentioned, a lot come from uh, the CAE, about a third, and um, and the other universities, um, 
on the new cap list at the advanced curriculum level anyway, probably wouldn't make it into that top 20 either. Uh, so I think most actuaries are not, not going to those uh, schools. And, and, you know, I mean, CAE, they may not be a top 20 university, but they have excellent programs in training actuaries um, uh, and to be, to be business leaders and, and good communicators. And they do a lot uh, more than just teach to the exams. Yeah, Gene, I might add to that. Um, and, and I don't know exactly why it is, but this has been a historical issue. Uh, sort of, I'll say famous top universities, although I, I think the University of Michigan may, uh, with their CAE program, may one think they are indeed a top 20 university. Uh, but you're right, for the most part, uh, schools people think of as top universities have historically never been involved in, in actuarial education. And we've made many attempts to reach out to, some, to those schools to, to see if they might have an interest in encouraging their students. Um, and, and to be honest, they've generally just not been interested. Um, it's just not something they've elected to devote uh, resources to to uh, preparing uh, their students. That doesn't mean students from those schools don't become actuaries. They most certainly do, but it's almost always been an independent choice. They've discovered the profession. They're obviously really bright students who have uh, been admitted to these top universities. Um, they make the choice to to become actuaries and embark on the exam pathway and uh, and, and have a career. So there's certainly students from those schools, but but uh, we've had a hard time uh, um, breaking into to some of those uh, well-known uh, prestige schools. And, and the one challenge with the UEC program is you've got to have a faculty member on the ground who's willing to represent the Society of Actuaries. So one, one of the things to keep in mind about this program is these universities are giving exam credit essentially on our behalf or you might even say we're sort of licensing them to do that. And that means we need really strict quality controls to make sure they uh, they operate the way we want them to when they do this. And one of those is we want, uh, we want an actuary in the classroom uh, being the one that's providing that instruction, creating the exams. And by being members of the SOA, we also know that they're going to be a, a feel a responsibility to, to do the right thing by by us and by their candidates. Thank you. Thanks for that additional information, uh, Stuart. Uh, so we are out of time. Uh, again, apologies for the late, uh, for the rough start here, getting going on the meeting uh, ID and the passcode. Um, but thank you, Gina, Marta, and Stuart for your leadership and expertise today. And a special thank you to all of you who joined us today uh, and to those who submitted questions. Uh, obviously, we mentioned that today's webcast was recorded and will be posted on the employer page within a week or so. So this concludes the uh, webcast for today. Please feel free to uh, send any additional comments or questions my way, and we'll make sure that they get uh, responded to immediately. So thanks so much. We're hoping to offer another one of these in July with some different content, maybe focused a little bit more around uh, the PD options. And uh, so again, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Amy.